Gospel of John this evening, and we're in John's Gospel and chapter 10, very well-known chapter, and we want to turn to it, and we'll take up the reading at verse 1 of the chapter. Now, the Lord Jesus is the speaker, and the Lord Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. God will add his blessing to this reading from his precious word of truth. Now, let's take time to pray together. Let's seek God's face at the throne of heavenly grace that we might know God's help and God's blessing in the ministry of the word and the gospel. Our heavenly Father, we bow our heads and hearts in thy presence again. And our Father, we want to thank you sincerely for a sense of your presence already in this meeting. We thank you, our Father, for the time for the time of praise that we have had, for the songs of Zion that we have enjoyed singing together, and for the great truths expressed in them. And our Father, I think we can all say that we have been blessed in our souls already in this meeting this evening. Now, Father, we come to that part of the meeting where it is our responsibility to handle the Word of God, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And our Father, we feel like one of old who said, who is sufficient for these things. But our Father, we thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit of God, and that he is the great enabler. He's the one who empowers. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God may take up the clay lips this evening, that God, the Holy Spirit, might speak in and through the preacher. And our Father, we pray that your word will come forth with simplicity and with clarity and with power. And thank you, our Father, that you're the all-seeing, all-knowing God. You know each of our hearts. You know where each of us stand before thee. You know those that are thine and those that are not. And our Father, it is for those that are not thine that we have a particular concern this evening. And our Father, we pray that the Spirit of God may move in the hearts of such, cause them to think about things eternal, bring them to see their need. And, O God, we pray that they might look to Christ tonight and see in him the one who is able to save their souls. So, Lord, we commit the proceedings of this meeting to thee and ask thee to glorify thy Son and to bless us in the Saviour's name. Amen. Uh, Friends, my text this evening uh, is a very well-known text. 
And it is that great text that we find in the Gospel of John in chapter 10 and verse 9, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Of course, friends, this picture is one that is drawn from agricultural life in the land of Israel. And of course, it it was particularly true when our Lord Jesus Christ walked as a man amongst men and exercised his public ministry there. Every morning, the shepherd would lead his sheep out to the pasture lands. The pasture lands weren't in closed fields like it is in our country. But the pasture lands were open, and the shepherd would lead his sheep out to pasture. And when a pasture in one area was consumed, then the shepherd would lead his sheep onto fresh pasture. And in the evening time, friends, the shepherd would lead his sheep uh, to the sheepfold. Now, some folks think that the sheepfold was home as far as the shepherd was concerned. But that is not so. The sheepfolds were in the wilderness. And of course, he would lead his sheep. And when he had them safely in the sheepfold, he would lie across the entrance into the sheepfold. And effectively, the shepherd would become the door. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ takes up this imagery. And he uses this imagery to emphasize this great truth that salvation is through Christ and through him alone. You know, as we come to consider this great text this evening, I want to speak to you, first of all, about the person of Christ. Friends, it seems ridiculous for me to state that John's Gospel, chapter 10, follows John's Gospel, chapter 9. Yet it's important for us to understand that in terms of follow-on. The great truths that our Lord Jesus Christ presents in John's Gospel, chapter 10, are presented in answer to a statement that was made in the Gospel of John and chapter 9. Of course, John's Gospel, chapter 9, is the inspired record of the healing of a man who was born blind. And of course, his healing sparked off great controversy concerning the person of Christ between the man who was born blind, the man who was healed, and the religious leaders and other religious Jews. And the position of the Pharisees is summed up in verse 29 of chapter 9. We know that God spake to Moses. But as for this man, speaking of Jesus, but as for this man, we know not whence he is. And of course, they were challenging the fact that Jesus was the God-appointed Messiah. And an answer to that statement In answer to that challenge, Jesus began the discourse that we find recorded for us in the Gospel of John and chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, said Jesus, he that does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, I don't know if you noticed it. As we read down through this chapter, you'll discover that in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, we read of a door. And then when we come on down the chapter a little bit, John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 7 to 9, we read of a door. And of course, uh, these are two different doors, very different doors because the door that we read of in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, is the door through which the shepherd entered. And the door that we read of in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 7 to 9, 
is the door through which the sheep enters. And of course, friends, the door through which the sheep enters is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. John Gospel chapter 10 and verse 1 speaks of the door through which the shepherd entered. And of course, that begs the question, is the door through which the shepherd entered important? Yes, it is vitally important. And I'll tell you why it is important. It is vitally important because it identifies for us the God-appointed shepherd of the sheep. You know, through the course of history, there were those who came upon the scene, and they came upon the scene claiming to be the Christ of God. But of course, we read of two of these self-appointed messiahs in Acts of Apostles in chapter 5. One was called Thutis. The other was called Judas of Galilee. Both these men were impostors, and evidently so. Do you know how we know? Well, I'll tell you how we know. We know because they did not enter via the door. They climbed into the role of Messiah another way. And by contrast, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, entered in by the door, and that is proof of his authenticity. What door was that, you might ask? Well, friends, the answer to that question is very simple. The door through which Christ entered is the door of the prophetic scriptures. And coming into the world, Jesus fulfilled all that the prophets had foretold about the coming of the Messiah. Friends, it would be possible, impossible for me to turn to every scripture scripture, every prophetic utterance that Jesus fulfilled. However, in the Gospel of Matthew, some 13 times we read that this was done, and that was done, and the other was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken in the word of God by the prophets. Five of these prophecies related to Christ's birth. Four of these prophecies relate to his public ministry. Four of these prophecies relate to his death. And I want you to understand it this evening that we can say that in his birth, in his public ministry, in his death, Jesus fulfilled all that the prophets had spoken concerning him. Concerning the Messiah's birth, the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Concerning his public ministry, Isaiah said, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Matthew adds this comment, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by his office. Isaiah the prophet, saying himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And concerning his death, the psalmist said, they pierced my hands and my feet. In his birth, our Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. For that which was conceived in the womb of Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. In his public ministry, our Lord Jesus Christ healed the sick and raised the dead. And in his death, his hands and his feet were nailed to a Roman gibbet. And it's Isaiah that informs us that when he was on the cross, God laid on him the iniquity of us all, and he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, and he bore the punishment that our sin deserved, and by doing so, he has provided us with a full and a perfect and a complete salvation. I want to say to you this evening, no one has ever done what Jesus did in order that we might be saved. I want you to understand that Muhammad didn't do it. 
Rastafarian didn't do it. Buddha didn't do it. None of the great religious leaders ever did what Jesus did. But Jesus, and Jesus alone, did all that was necessary in order that you and I might experience and know God's salvation. My friends, I want to talk to you for a little while about the picture that our Lord Jesus Christ uses. Text before us this evening, let me quote it again. I want to fix it in your minds. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 9 says, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Friends, the text tells me this. The text tells me that the one who came in by the door became the door, the door which, through which sinners could pass and enter into the blessings of God's great salvation. Friends, what a tremendous picture the Lord Jesus used when he said, I am the door. What wonderful simplicity. What wonderful familiarity there is in the idea of a door. You know, even in this jet-set, scientific, technological age, friends, great use is made of doors. The queen in the palace uses a door. The pauper on the street uses doors. The old, the young alike use doors. The educated, the sophisticated, the illiterate, and the simple all use doors. My dear friends, the Savior could mislead no one as to what he meant when he said, I am the door. Then first and foremost, I would suggest to you this evening that the door speaks of access. It is a door that gives you access to your car this evening as you came to this meeting. When you came into this building this evening, friends, it was a door that gave you access into this building. And when you return home this evening, friends, it will be a door that will give you access into your home this evening. And when Jesus said, I am the door, he was simply saying this, I am the way of access. And of course, friends, we ask the question, access to what? Well, the Lord Jesus leaves us in absolutely no doubt as to what he is the door of access to. Listen to the text. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And friends, the Lord Jesus is emphasizing the point that he is the way of access into God's salvation. You'll notice that he didn't say, I am a door. No, the Lord Jesus Christ used the definite article. He said, I am the door, indicating that he is the door and the only door, the only way of access into God's salvation. And of course, friends, it's the apostle Peter that bore witness to this truth. He said this in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And contrary to popular opinion, salvation is not through the ordinances. It's not through church membership. It's not through good works. Friends, salvation is through Christ and through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. <clears throat> but there's another great truth that I want you to understand this evening. You see, friends, a door speaks of access, and a door speaks of opportunity. You see, we often speak, don't we, of the door of opportunity. There used to be a, a poster on the bedroom wall of my daughter's bedroom. And the poster read, 
When God closes one door, he opens another. Friends, that poster spoke of opportunity. When Jesus said, I am the door, it's a reminder to us of the opportunity that is afforded to men and women to be saved for the great eternity. My dear friends, who amongst us could possibly deny that those words of Jesus, I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Who amongst us could deny that those words represent a tremendous opportunity afforded to be sinners, to be saved for the great eternity. Friends, on some doors there is a sign that says no admittance. But there's no such sign on the door of salvation. In fact, the opposite is true. Because on the door of salvation, friends, God says, enter ye in. On some doors there is a restrictive notice. A restrictive notice that that restricts access to certain people. We see it every day in the supermarkets and in the shops that we go into because very often in supermarkets and in shops and in such places there's a sign on the door that will say staff only. That's a restrictive notice. I want to say to you this evening, friends, that there is no such restrictive notice on the door of salvation. You know, there are some people, and they would seek to restrict God's salvation to a chosen few. But I want you to understand this evening, our Lord Jesus Christ knew no such thing. Our Our Lord Jesus Christ in our text says, I am the door <clears throat> by me. And notice the next three words. If any man, if any man covers all of humanity, all of humanity throughout all of the generations, and the call still goes out, if any man, it's an all embrace phrase. And I'm so glad that I can preach the gospel this evening and I can stand in the pulpit, and I can look down into your faces, and I can say without fear of contradiction, my dear friends, that the gospel message is an invitation to you, because the gospel message rings out, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and uh, and find pasture. But I want you to get this this evening. Friends, a door signifies access. A door signifies opportunity. Opportunity. And the door of salvation, my, it signifies opportunity to all without exception. But I want you to understand this. A door speaks of simplicity. Absolute simplicity. No doubt one of the reasons why doors have been in use for so long is because they are effective and it's because they are simple. It's simply a matter of entering in, isn't it? You know, friends, I uh, I have absolutely no objection to my wife sending me down to Tesco's to get the groceries. I don't mind that at all. Quite happy to go into Tesco's or go into Asda or go into any of these supermarkets, quite happy to go there and and to go in and to get the things that we need and to pay for them and to come out. But I want to tell you something. I absolutely hate it when my wife asks me to go shopping with her when she's going shopping for clothes. Hate it. Boy. That, 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 that That really tests me to the limits. And you know how it is, gentlemen, we all know, because it's all happened to us all, hasn't it? And, and, and she'll look at the shop window, and she'll look, and she'll say, I wonder will that suit me? <laughs> and then she'll say, I wonder will that fit me? Well, how would I know? 
And the only way she's going to find out is if she says, I'm going in. And then she takes the step that takes her through the door. And so it is with God's salvation. Friends, the sinner has got to come to the place where he makes a decision or she makes a decision and where they say to themselves, well, I'm going in. And she's got to take the step that takes her through the door. And friends, that's how it is with God's salvation. You've got to say, I'm going in for this. And you've got to take the step that that brings you into the sphere of God's saving grace. And of course, we know that that step is, that step is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you're ever going to be saved, I tell you this this evening, you must embrace Christ as Savior. And if you don't embrace Christ as your Savior, you'll never be saved. I often think of... uh, Brother David Knox, and David Knox was the missioner on the boats in Belfast Harbor. And David used to say this. He used to say one of the saddest, one of the saddest things in his ministry was to go onto the Dutch boats on a Sunday. And he'd go onto the Dutch boats and there would be no work going on in the boat on the Sunday, and the crew would largely be sitting in their cabin and would have the open Bibles in their hands. And Brother Knox would ask them, are you saved? And they would say, no, we're not saved. We're just waiting for God to save us. I want to tell you, friends, listen. I believe with all my heart that salvation is of the Lord. And it's of the Lord from start to finish. But whilst that is so, whilst God and the eternal counsels of heaven plan salvation, whilst our Lord Jesus Christ purchased salvation for us on the cross, whilst it's the Holy Spirit of God that affects salvation in the heart of the sinner, There is a responsibility that rests with the sinner. The sinner has got to take this step that takes him through the door. He's got to receive Christ as his Savior, and if he fails to do so, he'll never be saved, and he'll be lost for the great eternity. I wonder if I'm speaking to someone this evening. Someone this evening, and you've been hemming and hawing about this thing, and you've been fittering about, and you don't understand the urgency of it. You don't understand that we do not know what a day may bring forth. My dear friends, listen, this may be the last day that you will live on this earth. My dear friends, this day might be the day that will issue, that will usher you out into eternity to meet the God that inhabits eternity. And if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, you'll be eternally lost. Friends, I want you to see this evening the prospect that the Savior offers. What is the prospect that he offers? Well, listen to the text. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's the prospect. And what a glorious prospect that is for perishing sinners. My my dear friend, listen. You know, you may have come into this meeting this evening unsaved and still on your way to a lost eternity. But my, 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 there's tremendous prospect There's opportunity for you tonight to be saved. And and you can leave this meeting this evening not on your way to a lost eternity. You can leave the meeting on your way to heaven and to home. You know, I'm saved now some uh, 57 years. 
And I want to tell you something. You know, dear sinner, if you trust Christ as your Savior in the meeting this evening, you can leave this meeting, and I want to tell you, you'll just be every bit as well saved as I am. And not marvelous. That's the prospect he offers. Friends, there is only one alternative to God's heaven in eternity. And that is the place of eternal torment. Jesus described it as a place where there would be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He described it as a place of outer darkness. But I want you to understand that this evening, friends, there is absolutely no need for any man or any woman to perish. Why? Because there is sure hope in Christ. My, I have brought before you this evening Christ, the door. Tonight he is the door of opportunity, opportunity for you to be saved. But there's another truth, a solemn truth, a fearful truth. My dear friends, the door of opportunity could quite easily become the door of opportunity missed. I'm thinking of Noah's Ark. And I'm thinking of how God told Noah to build the ark. And Noah built the ark, and it took him 120 years to do so. And during that 120 years, Noah... Noah preached righteousness. Noah invited men and women to come into the ark to be saved. But they thought he was mad. You know, I hear people preaching about the ark. I've heard them. And I've heard them speaking about the day that the storm clouds started to roll up. Friends, I don't believe for one moment that the storm clouds rolled up in those day. Not for a moment do I believe that. Oh, no. Oh, no, I believe, friends, that the sun shone. There never had been rain before. Folk didn't know what rain was, though earth was watered by a mist that came up in the evening. And I believe the sun shone, and then there came the moment when God closed the door of the ark. The Bible says God shut the door. And the fountains of the deep were opened. And the canopy of water above the firmament burst. And the flood came. And those inside the ark were saved. And those outside of the ark perished. And so it will be. All things will continue as they were. And suddenly, Christ will come in the glory cloud. And the saved will rise to meet him. And the unsaved will be left behind. 
to face eternal judgment. I want to ask you tonight, listen. You have a decision to make concerning Christ. And tonight, whether you like it or not, you will make a decision concerning Christ. Because tonight you will either receive him as your Savior or you'll go back out through that door, a Christ rejecter, open to the wrath of God. Friends, it is our desire, our earnest prayer, that you'll be wise and embrace Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> And you'll not wait a minute longer to do so. But that you'll do it now. May God bless his word to your hearts for his name's sake. Now,